and I and right now 100% of the earth is uh, affected by my control or scalar waves that are transmitted now from satellites in space that completely ring the earth and are enhanced by ground uh, antenna that we see as cell tower microwave transmissions so that at any moment they can transmit a mind control wave to specific areas of the earth uh, to specific people and a lot of what's happening now with the chemtrails is also creating a web or a network around the earth like a shield for radio wiring so that it's a grid that covers the earth and they can pinpoint very specific locations now and transmit whatever they wish to to create just absolutely phenomenal. It employed how many people at the time when it was at its heyday? Well, you know, in those days, I was a mere subject. I wasn't in control of anything, so I had no idea how many people were in control. But I can tell you that there were at least hundreds of people that I used to see there, many of them in military uniforms, some of them in civilians, some of them looked like they were in scientific garb. Um, there were so many different people, and they were different at various times. There, I didn't see consistent people all the time, so I think they moved people around. But I figured out over the years, over the 13 years, all the the people that were used in the project. I estimate there had to be between 200,000 and 300,000 subjects on the experiment, and most of them did not make it. Was there? What do you mean they didn't make it? Well, right. I was told that less than one percent survived the experimentation. When you're bombarded with electromagnetic waves and microwaves oh. and uh, basically traumatized and tortured, uh, very few can survive that kind of life. And in fact, uh, a lot of the subjects were children, and so they just didn't make it. Children of maybe some of the people who work there? No, these uh, initially they used uh, orphans, they would use the uh, children who were in foster care, uh, people who they considered to be expendable and would not be missed. Um, then later on, as the subject, as the as the program progressed, then they would start taking children uh, from conventional families. People, uh, you, there are so many kidnappings in this country, especially you notice in spite in the 1970s and 80s. And these children were basically used for the mind control experiments. They knew, especially people with genetics of blonde hair, blue eyes, red hair, green eyes, such people have an enzyme in their genetics that allow for mind control to be more acceptable to the mind and the body. What did they do with these children afterwards? Well, their bodies were, those who didn't make it, their bodies were disposed of. They would uh, burn them, bury them under the ocean. They would dispose of them in whatever manner was convenient at the time. What about those who did make it? Well, a lot of them, unfortunately, are in such a mental state that they're not able to function very well in society. A lot of the people that we see in mental institutions, a lot of the people that we see in, in, in prisons, uh, many of them have been subjected to these mind control experimentations. One of the people that I did meet over the years, also connected to government, told me that he knows in a very remote area outside of Reno, Nevada, the government has a facility where they actually store some of the subjects of mind control who are being used for continuous study under the guise of it being a home for the elderly or insane. So and rather than kill them off, they have put them in this facility. Well, yes, they need to study. To watch them. Yeah. yeah, they need to study the effects. You know, how long will a person live? What will their mind be like? Will they regain their memory? They, it's like being a lab rat, basically, to see. They want to see what the results will be so they know what the population uh, generally can expect. Is this a black ops program, Stuart? I mean, Congress doesn't know about it. Well, yes, of course, it's under undercover. But there are many people in government now that know about it. Years ago, back in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, I'm pretty sure that many of the people in the mainstream government didn't know about it. But these days, the secret government is becoming the public government. Well, that's true. And so there's many now who know about this. And, of course, uh, 
I was told that uh, the government will never admit uh, a mind control experimentation because then they would be subjected to lawsuits and have to pay for uh, medical coverages, etc. So they're never, ever going to admit that. Now, this control, this mind control series of experiments, Stuart, what did they want to accomplish? Bottom line is they wanted to create a global robotic society, very much like you'd see on Star Trek The Borg, where everyone has a specific function, a specific designation. No one asks any questions. You just go through your life doing what you're told to do in a specific function, and you never deviate from that. And in that way, it ensures a society that does not change, and the control system stays intact. My gosh. And you know what? They're, they're pretty much there. When I look out there in the public and I hear how people react to things, they just believe whatever they're told. No one questions anything. I, yes, there's a few people who, who like myself, who, who make a lot of noise. But for the most part, people just follow along and don't question anything. It's they're, like the Pied Piper of him. Yeah, they're afraid. They're afraid because they're, what will the government say? What will they do to me? So they just go along with everything. You see this in the airports. You see this in, in, in office buildings. Everyone is terrified of going outside the box. Are you familiar at all, Stuart, with the work of Zacharias Sitchin? Uh, yes, of course. Now, where d does his work come in in terms of that planet that comes here, Nibiru? Um, you, uh, you didn't mention that. Yes. You see, here's the other thing. That Nibiru, which is also in some uh, cultures called Marduk, um, this is also an artificial object uh, which has an elliptical orbit in space. It is controlled by another type of reptilian being. It is not the Draco, but it's actually a different species. Uh, the Anunnaki, which, he said, right? Yes, yes, and they tend, they, uh, what we learned at Montauk was that that group was actually enemies of the Draco and that they were antagonistic towards each other. Now, interestingly enough, um, back in uh, 1999, I believe it was in LA Times and possibly also in the New York Times, there was an article stating that a, a large object a NASA had detected past the orbit of Pluto in an elliptical orbit around our sun and that we can expect to see that object come closer to the Earth around the year 2003. That was back in 1999. And as usual, when the New World Order government sends out information that they want people to know, they send it out in a little blip like that, and then you never see it again. And that's kind of their legal out that they told you everything and that it wasn't a surprise. Now, where did this knowledge, where did this information come to you? How? Well, when we worked in Montauk, those 13 years that I was there, there was a lot of indoctrination. We were basically told that what we were doing was for the good of the Earth, that humanity was not intelligent enough to control itself, that if people were left to their own device, they would pretty much destroy the planet. And so it was an obligation of this new world order to control things, to ensure that uh, our people and survive and the reptilians have a mindset where they feel an obligation to seek out and destroy or assimilate all other uh, creatures or species because they feel the reptilian life form is the most perfect representation of God or God mind and the reason that they feel that way is because reptilians in the Draco star system are androgynous meaning male and female in the same body and so they feel that most closely represents the neutral uh, God mind or God energy. Also, reptilian DNA does not change over eons of time. It basically stays the same and does not uh, alter, whereas mammalian DNA constantly changes and adapts uh, as environments change. And so they feel that because reptilians are so stable in genetics, it proves that they're superior. And again, I'm not qualifying this by saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying that that's how they think.